So, Lynn, um, when did you first get into swimming, mate, particularly long-distance stuff? Oh, the long-distance stuff came uh, in, in recent years. Oh, it's about eight years ago. I tore my bicep tendon off the bone, uh, mucking around with my two boys down the beach, uh, thinking I was going to have to do them in a sand fight. And I ended up chasing them down the beach, think, and then uh, throwing sand at them, and they throwing sand at me, and I'm thinking that I can bend down, scoop, and pick and throw in the same action, and my hand stayed in the sand, my body kept running, and there's this huge crack, and uh, I thought I'd break my arm, but it's actually the tendon coming off the bone. So official start And then I went down, right? and they thought I was dogging, so they just jumped on top of me, and started laying into me as well. Uh, so to push off them, and uh, uh, get pushed out into the channel, and then got, got home with Lisa, and I said, I'll hurt myself, and she goes, well, Go sort yourself out. So I had to drive myself to the hospital. <laughs> Got that sorted out. <laughs> she, she, Lisa's shaking her head in horror in the background going, that can't be right. But yeah, I did drive myself to the hospital. And um, I then, uh, I got a bit of physio on it, but it didn't seem right. So uh, I made a mine's orthopedic surgeon. I said, look, you know, this has happened. He said, come in. He said, no, nah, you, you, you're gone. So he said, come in tomorrow, I'm going to put you under the knife and reattached it. Uh, and then I couldn't, couldn't for rehab, I had my arm sort of out for about six, six, eight months. Couldn't have my hand for about the first three or four months. Couldn't lift one kilo weight. And then I just started doing a bit of swimming for rehab. Um, at school, I did a, a lot of swimming. I swam for the school. I don't know, okay level, got, got up and down the pool and mm. had, played a bit of water polo. And, uh, so I was comfortable in the water, and I said swimming's your best thing. So I started doing a bit of that, and when I made 100 metres, I was pretty happy with myself. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. yeah. That's so, it. so the seven, can you tell us a bit about the seven The seven peaks in swimming, a bit like the seven great... Yeah, well, you, I, I, the, you, 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 you bang on when you say that. So you've got the, the, the seven famous climbing peaks, uh, hardest seven in the world, and... Um, Fellow called Steve Martone, he's an American, uh, great coach and swimmer himself, uh, uh, came up with the idea of picking what he considered to be the seven hardest Asian channel swimmers in the world. We went to the seven peaks and uh, I was fortunate enough to um, complete them. I think, the, I think it's sort of the quickest time they've been done to date, within a, two to three, or three years. And, uh, Two years, Lisa tells me in the background. There you go. I, I, um, so then that, that was the uh, my first one was Gibraltar Strait. So you're swimming from Spain to Morocco. Uh, fantastic swim that was. Good, good fun. Right. Very, very uh, nervy. We were told about orcas and uh, hammer, great hammerhead sharks, but uh, didn't get to see many of them. A few dolphins. Um, well, actually, there were. I think there's a couple of hammerhead sharks going the other way that went past the boat, but we we didn't okay. see. Them. So that was uh, that one, and then the, the second one was English Channel, which they regard as the, sort of the Mount Everest of uh, swimming. English Channel became very popular in more recent years. And then uh, following that was the North Channel, which I did pretty much back-to-back. -back. Uh, I did about three weeks apart. Um, some say it's the, the North Channel is regarded as the hardest out of the lot. Uh, so if the English Channel's mm -hmm. uh, Mount Everest, um, North Channel's like the K2 okay. uh, of, of swimming. It's because of the currents. You've got cold, 12 degrees, and uh, all the way across. So it's from uh, Ireland to Scotland. And then we follow up Catalina Channel over in the States, the Catalina Island, across the Palos Verdes, the coast of California. Uh, so another cold channel. So a great white territory, that one. And then um, uh, Kauai. The um, Molokai Channel from um, Molokai to Oahu. That one was pretty brutal. I, I, I got the call from the captain. He said, look, if you can get here in the next three days, or two days actually, we can get you across and in the water. But if you're going to leave it another week, the trade winds are blowing out your whole window for the two weeks. So I literally walked out the door at work, jumped on a plane with uh, uh, Lockie, and flew straight across. We had three flights, 
Um, as soon as we got off the plane, cab to the to the water, Cup. got in, creamed up, jumped in, wise, five o'clock in the afternoon. Lucky had to swim out to the boat, no fees, no nothing, and then we swam through the whole night. And um, I got within about uh, th- uh, three to five k's from finishing that swim, just on dawn, having swum through the night. And I got stung over by box jellyfish. Ooh. So they, they uh, pulled me out of the water. I, I was just in agony. My body shut down uh, with the uh, Erikangi syndrome. And you know, I was rolling the back of the head. So I, sp- I spent the night in uh, or spent the uh, hospital on morphine for a fair while on that one. Two weeks before that, I stood on a stonefish. So it was uh, not a great lead up as well. I, 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 had, I had two days of intensive care in uh, the Gold Coast uh, on ketamine in one arm and all in the other arm. And then 10 days after that swim, with, uh, well, I didn't finish because of the uh, box jellies, I went back and uh, swam the whole thing again to go to work. So it was uh, pretty proud of myself on that one. It was quite an emotional thing to come back. After that, that uh, scenario, and then the last two was uh, Siguru Channel in, in uh, Japan from Honshu to Hokkaido. Uh, lots of tuna <laughs> in that neck of the woods. That was, a, that was another beautiful uh, swim, and then finished off with uh, the Cook Strait, which uh, turned out to be an absolute beast. I had to go back to New Zealand three times just to get the the right conditions the first two times it was blowing out same right. the second time the third time got within three k's of finishing and there's a massive tide shift from the north came down and three three k's to go I'm normally hopefully about an hour to knock that over well, that took about three and a half hours to finish the last three k's to punch through that tide and after you spent you know 12 hours or so in the cold water of the court it was pretty brutal so that was the yeah, that was the Ocean Sevens was the first Aussie you know, I think it was about the 12th or 13th in the world to have done that great so how does the swim around Lord Howe rate how would you rate it as compared to your other swims you've done mate uh, that's a, a a tough and fair question it's probably the most incredible swim I've ever done um, I, 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 I reflect so fondly on all those ones I've mentioned. I've been fortunate to do many others as well for different reasons. And I, I guess that was in the context of the nation's swim. But here I was doing it um, to raise money as well for the Adrift Lab and the ocean plastic issues, particularly with your shearwater, freshwater shearwater board, birds on the island who are uh, subject to the plastic. So that was... Um, yeah, special. I was able to help mm. uh, contribute there, but the swim itself—it is truly the most extraordinary uh, island in the world. The swim that I've ever done. And every season of my day, I think yeah. <laughs> we had rain, we had sunshine, we had wind, we had calm. Um, the conditions were. You know, sometimes you get a rough swim and it's rough all the way, or it's calm. This one just sort of had it all. It's, as you know, Jack, you know, uh, through your expert uh, tutelage, getting us around the island. It was a, it was a second seas when we had, you know, we're assisting the currents all the time, adjusting course and all the rest, but across the top of the island, I mean, uh, that was quite bouncy with off the cliffs and uh, the wash, mm-hmm. and then coming down the the, the east coast, the, the, the beaches there. Mm-hmm. But just the scenery as well, it was just... Uh, I mean, I, I think you told me to get a hurry up a couple of times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just sort of uh, no, uh, in, in, awe, no, or, in awe of the beauty. And it, it, just mm. it was extraordinary looking at the, the rugged sea, landscape, but then also the seascape was going on underneath. Um, and also, I think it's like just incredibly enjoyable. I mean, I'm pretty fortunate to have my beautiful family on just about every swim. So, you know, took, took my, my, my beautiful bride, Lisa, on another lovely boat cruise on Valentine's Day this day. Mm. So, yeah, around the island. <laughs> and, yeah, Nicholas and Lachlan, um, yeah, they've been with us on most of the uh, adventures as well, and paddling or feeding and support and Angie. Uh, she's amazing. She's probably 
walk and swim yeah. at various stages with me. And but also the, um, the sense of community on Lord Howe is just extraordinary. Uh, I'm just incredibly grateful, especially to you, you know, and to Sydney for, for what you did, giving up your time to play this around and support the cause. And just the Islanders, they're generally just so welcoming mm-hmm. and engaging and yeah, caring and supportive of it. And, you know, we, we, we had um, people I've never met who were coming out and supporting on the, on the ski or on the boat um, with, you know, Stephen and Carol and Rachel, uh, people I've never met, but, you know, it felt like they're mates. And then uh, Dean as well, I think was the other one. And uh, then we had, Tre- we had Trevor Handy, who's a you know, Queensland Gold Coast boy um, as well. Running his swim camp over here with uh, Michael Bannister, and uh, Banners was amazing. He's on the paddleboard with Rach around most of the island, was swimming with me, and, and Trevor was fantastic too. With, with Jack, he's constantly communicating at the time he was out there uh, with, with the currents. But apart from that sense of community, it was just like a great, like to me, it was a, it was a fun, enjoyable swim. Uh, it wasn't like it wasn't about the time. It was just the destination and the journey and getting there, appreciating what we're doing it for. And then um, we had a few marine visitors uh, along the way. Uh, the island's quite well known for its Galapagos sharks. Uh, I was told also that February's uh, tiger tiger shark season as well. They had a four metre, wasn't it? They spotted just recently. But Jack Connolly pointed out to me the exact spot where I was having a feed. That's exactly where they spotted it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then uh, I, on the East Coast, I think it was on the East Coast and coming around Gower. Uh, Gower, Mount Gower, which was just yeah, extraordinary. Looking up there, we started getting a few Galapagos sharks coming at each feed and they'd increase in numbers gradually and they start coming up a bit higher and I sort of report back to Jack how it's going and he's going, well they're getting you know, inquisitive or aggressive and I think when I got to about 10 or 12 of them I said well and then one came up and breached sort of had a bit of a look how are you? <laughs> I said, mate we've got about 12 in the water now, we probably did but anyway <laughs> might have been 20 of the bastards to each yeah. other I think was the uh, exact uh, wording of it. But that was uh, Incredible stuff. We had look, we had chuck shoes on, which we, we didn't use them at all for uh, towards the end. It was only yeah. when that uh, Galapagos came up and breached. It was thought, sort of, well, that's probably just getting a little bit too close, too inquisitive. And in the meantime, I think you know, Lockie and Nick and Angie, had, when I was having a feed and the sharks in the water, they'd jump in. You know, Lisa would tell them, well, you know, hop in with Dad, <laughs> rather than using shark shields. Is that right, Dar? No, but it's all, it, was all, it was all very controlled and safe and there was no aggressive behaviour, so we, you know, we, we took it all very seriously, but uh, uh, that was you know, an extraordinary experience to you know, have that sort of marine life around you. Um, and, and again, as I say, the support was just unbelievable by everyone and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see them in Shipjack second to none, so uh, you know, very grateful and appreciative you. for your work there.
just very grateful too to everyone that's contributed uh, to this fantastic uh, cause and not just financially but uh, contribution to uh, cleaning up the environment and uh, helping out uh, Dr Jennifer Lavers with the Drift Lab. She and her team planted 30 Australian natives down in Tasmania and uh, pulled out 30 noxious weeds so it's a real across the nation sort of scenario and then you've got over in the UK part of the Drift Lab Dr Alex Bond who ran an extraordinary 30 k's and uh, freezing cold temperature so kudos there uh, some of the Grimsley swim team mates or a bunch of them that I uh, swam back back in Brisbane with they, they did uh, I think 30 50s with rubber bands to sort of bring attention to the issue of the plastic so everyone's been uh, fantastic and, and on board with this and all the islanders here too incredibly supportive so yeah a great cause if you get an opportunity uh, and you want to donate you can it's to just go to hashtag day of 30 and that'll bring up the the relevant link or go to the adrift lab website and uh, yeah we'd be grateful for uh, any further donations it's just a fabulous cause